All right. So if the, if the first goal is to not get stuck, let's say we do get stuck. We want to have some equipment along with us to help us get unstuck. These, these stories show that uh, drapery doesn't really work. <laughs> uh, frogs don't really work. Um, and in Matt's case, um, listen to your wife. Yeah. I yeah. guess you driving doesn't really work. I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, like every rad picture I have of a truck somewhere cool and somewhere very remote. Yeah. She's the one driving. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so we want to have the right equipment along and because we are trying to be responsible in our podcast, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about safety equipment. So uh, these are recommended items. Um, there's a counterpoint to it as well, but it is a good idea to start with gloves. Um, I do wear gloves, but I, you know, I've got it. This is something that I've got an opinion on, but I would love to know your thoughts. Jim. Loose gloves, so, tight gloves, loose, loose gloves versus tight gloves. There, some people love the idea of these really loose gloves that in the, in the one, like, like a breeze, like someone, someone coughs five feet away and the glove falls yeah, off. Yeah. Well, yes. it's, it's in case it gets caught by, I mean, yeah. I've never seen this happen in, in, it, ever, but it's only going to get caught. I have snagged a glove. Yeah. And on a wire rope. Yeah. Um, yeah I, it, do you wear again, loose gloves or do you wear tight gloves? Um, I wear, um, well, I, I call them mule skinners. They're just regular, they're gloves, but they're reinforced a bit. Yeah. They're not winching gloves. Um, it, so they're kind of in the middle. Um, gotcha. I think like a, a mechanics glove or, or a, a, a rope glove or something like that, that actually Velcro's on. I can see the problem. But again, if it becomes a problem, your winch operation practices are bad. You're too close to the winch because yeah. the whole thing for those folks who, who, who have never got into the loose glove, tight glove debate is as you're, as you're putting the winch line on the spool, if you, uh, with wire rope, it was a biggie. Although here in Arizona with the uh, Choya cactus, if you don't know what Choya cactus is, <laughs> they hurt, avoid them. Look it up. Um, so they can, with, with synthetic rope, you can get a, a cactus in there and sure. I've seen that and you can get snagged almost the same as wire rope, but it's, it, you end up with a little burr. It snags your glove. You're operating too close to the winch and it sucks your hand in through the fairly. Sure. Um, and there's whole, there's winch run in and all that. And we can talk about that whenever you like. Um, but winches don't stop immediately. They continue to roll a little bit until they, they kind of roll to a stop and they're under full power. They have all that gearing while they're still moving. Sure. So if, if you get hung up on the wire rope, and you're two inches away and you let go of the button, your hand is going to get pulled through that fair lead. Yeah. And, and again, my, my 9,000 pound winch won't, won't bat an eye at pulling this hand through. It just, and it will, it will be nasty. So loose, loose gloves, you could get out of it when it snags. The problem with loose gloves and the problem that I always had with them, because I've got, it seemed like Warren and, and all, well, not just, I'm not picking on Warren, but super winch. Everybody gave you a pair of gloves. When you, when you got a winch cut. Sure. and they were these massive loose gloves, you have zero dexterity. That's the challenge. So you're yeah. constantly fighting with the, yeah. with the shackles and you're fighting with the connection points and you're, you're and, taking them off. Yeah. And you're <laughs> end up yeah, needing to take them off. So I think, I think it is an interest and we're not saying that one way is right or wrong. Um, but I think when it comes to the loose gloves versus uh, tighter gloves, use the thing that allows you to be most proficient and successful in the recovery and then use good recovery practice. So that way you don't get your hands into scenarios that involve pinching. Yeah. Don't stick pull. your hand in the wind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a bad idea. Yeah. It's a really bad it's idea. A, All right. So that's, that's the, that's the glove thing. <laughs> I also like to recommend that people have on glasses, whether it be safety glasses with clear lenses at night or just a, your pair of sunnies during the day, sunglasses during the day. And that's because I have, I have encountered when under load, um, some of these components can kick out um, rocks or they can kick out metal shards. Yeah, like a snatch shot can throw dust and little oh, mini absolutely. particles like everywhere yeah. when it tensions. I think it's a good idea to have glasses on as well. I also think that it's a good idea to have on sturdy boots and because you can drop <laughs> drop a pulley block on your foot, mm. which um, people, you only do that once. Yeah, though. people yeah. have done that um, to actually with significant injury. So it's a good idea to have boots on. Um, it's a good idea to not have loose clothing. Um, I certainly don't have a problem with long hair, but if you've got longer hair, you want to have it tied back. 
Um, so that way your hair doesn't fall into the winch while you're working on the rope. Um, Speaking or, from experience. <laughs> and, and, and zero experience. I have zero experience with that. <laughs> but again, the counterpoint to all of this safety stuff is um, be really careful around the whole virtue shaming concept of like you see an image and someone's in flip flops and they don't have a glove. Um, they're out there doing it. Um, I see that most of the people that complain about this kind of stuff are typically people that are yeah, not, not I mean, doing it. So like, listen, the amount of times you get stuck compared to the amount of times you, you, you hop into your four wheel drive, especially when you're a traveler, I, I, I don't need to dress like SEAL Team 6 to go drive around in my air-conditioned car uh, to go down a, a road that I'm perfectly capable of doing. Occasionally, you get stuck, and you. I, I think that the key thing there is that you don't put your hand in the winch. You know, don't, 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 just don't be a moron, right? Use common sense. <laughs> if it were that but simple. But like, yeah, yeah. like if, if you're setting out to go recreational four-wheel driving, yeah, like maybe don't wear board shorts and flip-flops, but... When I'm driving down the beach for 200 kilometers in Cape York, yeah. I, I'm not wearing shoes. Right. You know, I, but yeah. that's just me. There, there's your counterpoint. Like, just, you know, be smart. If you're in a situation where you clearly recognize like, hey, I shouldn't be wearing, should not be wearing these clothes. Well, then reevaluate. Um, Make but, that part of your assessment. Should yeah. I change my clothing? Should I add gloves? Should I put on glasses? Uh, should I be mindful of the fact that I have long hair because I've been traveling for a long time and it's gotten gotten long, whatever. But uh, I think. I wonder if, if Dan Grek has ever got his hair stuck in his winch because ah, he's got, he's man, got that he's got long he's hippie. He's got some locks. He's got he's that got hippie some, hair. Yeah. He's got some locks. Yeah. So those are some general ideas around safety equipment, uh, but also be really careful around the whole virtue shaming thing of yeah. um, it just, it just makes you look silly. So, um, but then after that, uh, what are the fundamental, what's the fundamental equipment? And what, what would you say if you, if someone was just getting started with travel and four wheel driving, what were the, what would be the few pieces of equipment that you would recommend around recovery that everybody brings in their, in their vehicle, Jim? And now, let's assume that they don't have a winch. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, and I'll, I'll just back that up until I did camel. So when I did camel trophy, super winch gave us a free winch. That's the first winch I ever owned. Yeah. Um, Little known fact on my resume to get on the Camel Trophy team, I lied and said I'd used winches left and right. <laughs> what I meant was come alongs because um, <laughs> sure. they were inexpensive. Um, so, I mean, we talked about it and just looking at, at the list, it's, it's a good list is a shovel. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I am not bashing anybody who comes up with with a uh, uh, an overlanding shovel, but um, I, I'm cheap. Yeah. I, I'm cheap. The shovel in my vehicle now is a is actually an old uh, um British military, uh, T-handle shovel. Yeah. It kind of proximates, pucks, whatever. Um, the, the camel trophy shovel which sure. was, was a, a bulldog. The Carter, yeah. Carter shovel. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it works good. It's short. It works you to death, but, um, I, I don't get the, the four and $500 shovel thing. Um, again, I'm sure they're brilliant shovels. Um, it, but have a shovel. It yeah. doesn't matter if you go down to, to home Depot and buy a $12 shovel or, or, or have, a great shovel, a five hundred dollars shovel, but um, I like to carry stuff that I can do multiple things with it. It's not yes. a single use piece of equipment. So you can go poop with your shovel just as easily, exactly, as you get unstuck with your shovel. Yes. I, I like a yeah. That's like ninety percent of what yeah, I use totally, my shovel for. Much, totally, or much. you're you know snuffing out a fire or whatever yeah, you use yeah, it for yep. general utility things, or you're you're digging a hole so you can level your vehicle or whatever. Yeah, but, I, I think that my shovel came from the Korean War. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I bet it works. So well, I like it, it. It works. I like a T-handled shovel. I like a D-handled yes. shovel. I like a shorter shovel. Force. So you can you can get a little bit of force. You can also get underneath the vehicle fairly easy. I like for it to be a spade. Um, if you're in the snow, of course, you want something that is flat nose so you can displace more material. Um, sand. It can go either way. Don't get too hung up on it. But I think that you should always have a shovel with you. And it's a really good idea to make it a spade that's a little shorter so you can get up underneath the vehicle yeah. easily. I, I really like those Glock and trenching tools as yeah, well. Yeah, that's a good one. You turned me onto those a while ago and I want to say they're 30 bucks. They're not that expensive. They have a, yeah. they have a saw in one end. They do fold down so you can use it as a, I want to say a trowel is the technical yep. term to, 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 
clear stuff from underneath the vehicle at a 90 degree angle. They, they work well. Um, you know, I've used the expensive shovels like the Demos shovels. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they're they cool. They work well too. Yeah. They're cool. But like, I, you know, I, I recognize the irony, you know, there's, there's, there's cheap versions of the product that I sell. Um, but for me on a shovel, there's, I don't see the value perhaps in spending a huge amount of money on a shovel. Right. Um, but you do want to have good quality equipment um, and you want to have it with you. So, you know, yeah, it's just spend, it's spend just what you want. Use case. Um, if you need something that folds up, if you need something that's light, if you need something that looks super cool to your buddies, then you, maybe you want a different shovel. Need versus want, right? Yeah. yeah but yeah. at the, at the end of the day, we do want to have a spade, uh, that's a little shorter in length and it's really good idea if it's T handled or D handled as yeah. well. So that's a, that's a really good idea. What else do we want to bring along, Jim? Um, so most of my decisions of how I load my car is, is how far afield I'm going yeah. and who I'm going with. If I'm going by myself and I'm going very remote, um, then I typically take a little bit more gear. I have to be able to self-rescue. Um, so I mean, in, in my box, I mean, I I'm a minimalist. Um, so I've got, uh, a kinetic strap. Uh, I've got a, a, uh, um, static strap for, that's my tree strap. Um, I've got a few winch extensions. I've got a few soft shackles. I've got a few bow shackles, um, a pulley block, um, eliminate most of those things. If you don't have a winch. Sure. Um, so, uh, people, you see pretty much. People love high lift jacks. Um, I have a high lift jack. 95% of the time it sits in my shed. It never goes on my car. I used, I've had it for probably 50 years. <laughs> sure. Um, it's it's really hard to argue against the utility and the use case of a high lift jack, yeah. but I'm I'm in the same thing. Like they're, I've used it they're to 80 car. pounds to yeah. yeah. Ugh, it's you'd miserable. rather have one than not have one. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And we'll talk about the use of the high lift also um, for recovery. It's a little bit more of a challenge uh, to use, but it can it can be suitable. Um, so we yeah, we want to have a recovery strap or we want to have a kinetic energy recovery rope that is rated to 1.5 to two times gross vehicle weight. Or if you're over gross vehicle weight, 1.5 to two times what that rate that what that weight is. You want to be closer to two times if you're going to be traveling with mixed vehicles. If you're going to be traveling with like vehicles, you can be closer to that 1.5 times uh, gross vehicle weight. And then you want to have a couple, um, two, three uh, screw pin C or D shackles along with you as well. All right. So now that we've got a recovery strap or a cur, we we want to have two or three screw pin C or D shackles. C is the most common. Uh, they're typically going to be rated around four and a half tons. Um, if you get a Van B shackle, it'll be rated around six metric tons. Um, Soft shackles are also a thing too. I really like those. Um, again, I think that they just, the more metal that you can remove from a recovery scenario, personally, I think the better. Um you know, they're definitely more expensive than a, than a, than a screw pin shackle, but I think there's a lot of benefits to them. I mean, I yeah. like having both of them along. Yeah. The, the yeah. concern that I have with soft shackles is that they are vulnerable to sharp edges yes. on the chassis. Um, a lot of times when we're doing recoveries, uh, we may not notice that there's that little piece of flashing or um, when we put it into the factory recovery point, we don't notice that there's something in there that's sharp or we need to, we need to put it around something that's in non-conventional. So I like to have both. I think uh, obviously the biggest advantage to soft shackles is the fact that it reduces mass from a connection point. So soft shackles can be really great for that. What do you think on that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I absolutely carry both. Um, um, learned how to tie them. So that reduces the expense a little bit, um, which is kind of nice. Um, and exactly. And we, we, we mentioned Dyneema in general for, for winch lines, but the, we didn't really go over the, the weaknesses or the problems with Dyneema is what you said, they don't like shark objects under load. They can, they can uh, uh, cut quite easily. They don't like heat. Um, they don't like abrasion. So any of those areas where those could happen, I, I put a, a, put a, a, a bow shackle in yeah. um, just cause yeah, I mean, it, again, it's the the wire rope versus synthetic. Yeah. They both have their places. And I uh, think like for utility, yeah. I, I, I still like wire rope. 
I mean, you know, if I had a if I had a brush truck, I'd probably have wire. Oh, right. Yeah. Something that's going to have maintenance, et cetera. Yeah. Um, totally. Yeah. If you're winching all the time, yeah. especially in muddy environments where a lot of materials getting impregnated into the winch line. Yeah. The synthetic line is just not a good solution for yeah, sure. Absolutely. All right. And then I would also make the argument for a recovery board as a part of a basic recovery kit, uh, because it is, it's so common that someone that's new to driving will get themselves overstuck. They'll get too stuck where you just can't get out with using these basic, uh, recovery, um, skills like airing down and shovel and, and all that other stuff. So having a way to self recover, um, we don't always have other vehicles with us. So I just permanently leave a set of max tracks. Uh, there are other brands as well. Um, during the camel trophy days, they use the PSP, PSP board, um, yeah. which PSP in dry conditions is fantastic. Um, they struggle a lot once things get wet because, oh. um, they just don't have the traction, the surface traction of a modern recovery. I, I, I board. think, I think there's this little downside to a recovery board. I mean, seldom are they going to make a scenario worse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. True. Um, Absolutely. You know, that's, that's the way I look at it. I'll kind of stay out of that one for, well, I mean, you know, there, it, 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 it kind of comes down to they're either going to work or they're not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite literally that simple. And if they work they're they're absolutely save you a whole bunch of work. I, I always like to say, you know, when we crossed the Simpson desert with our land cruiser that had like four horsepower <laughs> and weighed like 18 million pounds, we would lay them down proactively, yeah. you know, on that sand dune that you know that you're not going to make it up. I, I, I always liked doing that and I still do that with, with our kind of camper vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. You can build a road, uh, with recovery boards and, um, yeah, I've, I've had to do that on mini kit just recently with the new defender, we were in the coral pink sand dunes and we had a less experienced driver and, and, uh, they were struggling. And by using, um, the max tracks in this case, um, they were shocked. They were literally wide eyed at how, you know, you turn it over, use it as a shovel, move a bunch of material out of the way, um, shove it up underneath the tire, give it a little press with your foot so that it gets uh, planted and then slowly apply throttle so that the lugs of the tire can begin to key with the teeth of the treadboard. Um, then it, it just, it pops you out so quickly. So they really have a lot of use. And I think that they are a fairly good idea to bring along as a fundamental piece of kit. You can move them from vehicle to vehicle. If you sell your truck, um, it's easy to just take it on with a new vehicle. So I, I think they're actually a fairly good investment in that regard. Yeah. And, and I think too, not, not to dwell on it or, or trying to sound biased, but for those that maybe don't have a winch or don't, they're travelers that don't have the budget to obtain one and do not have the training. It's just cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and with regards to the winch, people think, okay, you know, uh, I'm going to say I'm going to get a, a good quality winch. It's going to be eight to a thousand dollars. That's kind of just the start. Yeah. So now I have to have a way to uh, attach it to my vehicle. So a, a good quality bumper for, for my old Land Rover is 1200 bucks. Um, and now the winch itself, I need, I need a winch kit recovery kit that has all the pieces, the tree strap and all and the pulley block and all that. So it's not just the purchase of the winch. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful tool. I probably yeah, never, would never would argue be against the utility of one. No, absolutely. But you just have to, if it's just not economically feasible for you, then there are much less expensive ways to more labor intensive, but, but to get the same thing done. Yeah. And it can be more expedient. It can also help you go backwards really easy. Uh, uh, you can use a front mounted a vehicle winch to winch rearward as well. Uh, but it's, it's more complicated around vehicles uh, that are newer um, where they're less um, okay with running winch cables. <laughs> yes, <laughs> underneath them and stuff. Yeah. You know, they, I mean, you think about all of this, the sensors and airbags and I mean, anyways, we don't, we don't need to go into that kind of a detail on it, but um, there are times that you want to just make it very simple and sometimes going uh, in reverse is the best way to get out of a scenario for sure. Um, so now let's move on to the, the basic equipment that we want. Now that we've introduced um, potentially a vehicle mounted winch, um, or we want to take into consideration additional scenarios, 
Um, that's where I would absolutely include the recovery boards, uh, two, ideally four recovery boards. Um, you also want to include a utility strap or a tree strap. This is going to be something with null stretch. Um, if it is Dyneema, it needs to have some kind of padding around it if you're going to use it uh, as a tree strap. So that way we don't uh, disturb or break the cadmium of the tree and do damage to the tree. So uh, we, we'd never want to do that. So we never want to wrap a winch line around a tree. Um, we always want to use a tree strap or something that can distribute that force um, on the bark. Um, so we do want to have some kind of a utility strap. Um, we also want to consider bringing along a line dampener or knowing what we can use as a line damper. So um, a messenger bag works great for that with a few things put in it, soft things put in it with some weight. Um, we can also use a, a duffel bag and we can put the strap around it. There's a, a jacket, wet, a wet sweatshirt a, or something. Yeah, a jacket, something it, now something is match. better than nothing. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's, that's where that whole um, counterpoint thing comes in. Yes. It's great to have the, um, the safety jacket. Yeah. The, the, the safety jacket, the, this is, this is what we're talking about here. This is a recovery damper. Um, great to have one of these, but that's a, you know, at its core, what is this? This is, sorry, but, uh, <laughs> you know, this is what, like a, like a nylon with a little bit yeah. of weight yeah. into yeah. it. You know, yeah, my, my sweatshirt probably doesn't weigh much yeah. more than that. Um, the whole idea is if it breaks, it drops it to the ground. Yeah. It doesn't let it fly up. And, yeah. and so whatever works to dampen that, it's fine. The line damper has two functions. Uh, it functions as a sail, which means we want to have surface area. So that way, when or if the line breaks, it slows it down as it moves through the air. We want to add a sail area to it. Uh, and then we want, also want to add a little bit of weight, but weight that's safe if it impacts another vehicle or an individual. Uh, and that weight helps to bring the line down to the ground. So we want to have some surface area and we want to have a little bit of weight to it again, um, we don't want to we don't want to hang a bunch of shackles on the line. Um, that's that's totally counterproductive. <laughs> so, uh, but line damper is a good idea, or knowing how to do an improvised line damper. Uh, we want to bring along additional shackles. That's probably a good time to start looking at the soft shackles as well, and understanding how they work and getting some training on that um, as well. Um, and then once we introduce a winch into that. Uh, we want to start to be able to take advantage of the mechanical nature of a winch by introducing one or multiple pulley blocks to increase the capacity of the winch. And we're doing that mechanically. It's a gearing effect. Um, now, when we increase the mechanical advantage of the winch with a pulley block, we are reducing the line speed by approximately half. It's actually a little bit more than that because we've introduced some parasitic drag into the system. But um, in general, we have to understand that things are going to be a little slower, which is rarely a bad thing, right, Jim? Yeah, no, like I say, it's a slow, melodic, methodical process. So um, the uh, there's some competitive winches out there. Look at that monster. Here, let's get this out of here so it doesn't confuse people. Um, <laughs> yeah, so... My dad, God bless him, uh, had had a couple sayings, and he said he got them from an old guy, and and my dad was an old guy then, and apparently I'm an old guy now. But it, he said, it, it, it basically, if you get a little stuck, what's the first thing you do? You make lunch. Yeah, slow down. Slow down. Yeah, if you get really stuck, you make camp. Yeah. Um, so, and the whole point there is, uh, and again, we kind of hit on it earlier, is especially with a winch or even a kinetic recovery is if you do it wrong, bad things can happen. At the very least, it won't be successful. At the very most, somebody gets hurt or, or equipment gets gets broke. Um, so, uh, it's, it's really good to slow down, come up with a good plan. Um, uh, one of the things, especially when you introduce a pulley into the process, is it's more critical to think of where's my weak link. Um, point there is, is so if I have a winch extension going from a tree anchor or whatever to the pulley, and then it's double lined back, understanding that if the winch is full at full power, so mine's a 9,000 pound winch, so that's 18,000 pounds is pulling. What's the rate on the extension? Because right. that's, whereas the winch line's only taking nine on each side, it's splitting that, but where that goes to the tree. So you have to always build to the program's weakest link. Correct. So. What's that single point of failure? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Now on the table, we just put uh, down, uh, this is this is actually sold by 7P and there's other 
other ones out there. Max Track sells ones as well. Uh, but we have a uh, synthetic line that's turned into a synthetic shackle. Um, a beefy one. Yeah, very oh, yeah. beefy one. Yeah, that's, uh, the- yeah that's, it's a monster. And then we have a machined aluminum ring yeah. uh, that goes inside it. So, Jim, give us, give us the incentive towards using a product like this. Uh, there are people that um, have some concerns with them, yeah, um, and I think that they're valid. Uh, but there's also definitely some usability behind these things as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, what what brought this to people's mind? Why are they becoming more popular? Again, uh, this absolutely came out of the sailing industry. Yep. Um, these kind of these kind of pulley blocks are used uh, quite. Uh, yeah, they even have like carbon fiber ones. Oh, yeah. for yachts, well, yeah, like uh, on the the the, the America's the, Cup boats yeah, and yeah, you know. Yeah. I don't have one of those. Um, <laughs> you don't? No. Um, so, what do we have on here? Again, you know, what we used before that was uh, whether you call it a shiv or a pulley block, or um, they do they do they work? Absolutely, they work. Um, this came about again. Uh, a good friend of mine kind of kind of started having a thing because again, synthetic rope has it's the strongest based on the radius. And there's a whole formula for radius. I do not know what that formula is. Um, sharp edges, we already said it doesn't like that. Um, and so the the radius inside of a recovery ring, and pretty much all of them have kind of the same radius as far as, far as the inside goes, um, is more conducive to, to synthetic rope. It likes that bend better than the radiuses for a regular uh, pulley block. Um, Depending on on the cheeks of the pulley block or how it's designed, it can actually abrade if the if the synthetic rope is sticking up above. Whereas sure. these are very very deep, um, so you can get some failures there. Um, again, pluses and minuses. I, I, that's that's the I beat that horse to death. Um, one of the one of the minuses of this, and why pe- most people who don't like it, they don't like it because if you put your program together and it's not tensioned up, you have to keep an eye on this. Once you tension it up. If you've built your program right, um, you're fine. But if you or say if you're doing a drive winch, is, yeah, that is doesn't a work. <laughs> really good. Yeah, yeah, you can, but you have to be amazingly disciplined. Yeah, you cannot difficult. completely unload. If you unload the system, the rope can fall right out of this, and that's yeah. a problem. It's very difficult. Yeah. So you have to keep an eye on it, which means that it can fall out of the ring. Absolutely. And then you need to shut down the driving operation so that you don't you're not shock loading it or you're not putting rope on rope, which would very quickly. Yes. Cut, cut through it. Right. Um, and certainly there's not only the radius for the winch line, but there's also the diameter of the ring, which will help uh, distribute heat. Um, it will also um, give some additional mechanical advantage, mostly around heat um, and that radius. But if it gets too big, then you've got a, this huge piece of material you've got to carry along with you. And um, it adds a lot of weight to your kit. So there's a reason why these things are the diameter that they are and that they have the radiuses that they do is to manage heat um, and also to minimize the likelihood of damage to the Dyneema. I I think for Overland travelers, at the end of the day, you cannot carry everything with you. You have a certain amount of weight. You have a certain amount of stuff that you can fit in spaces, right? Um, When I look at the way that I travel and the way that I go off road, et cetera, um, I am less inclined to bring a traditional pulley block. They are, are pretty heavy. You know, they kind of move around, they rattle, you know, they're very useful. I'm not arguing against the utility Absolutely. of them. Um, but when I, when I look at how I travel, this is a lot more, this is a lot more approachable, right? Um, you can carry one of these, you know, for, for most people in most situations in overlanding, they probably never should need a pulley <laughs> block. Let's be realistic. Um, But when you do have to do more advanced rigging, something like this at, you know, two pounds right now becomes worth its weight in gold, right? So this is really easy to just throw in. Uh, I personally, I don't know how you feel about this. I look at the recovery ring as more of a casual user. I look at the pulley block as maybe more of a, a professional or commercial use case. Um, that's that's just how I tend to recommend them. You know, full disclosure, we do sell these things too. Um, you know, but just not quite as good, right? 
Well, we'll fight about that one later, bro. No, but I, I just, I, that's, that's the way I break it down. If somebody's coming to me and they're saying, Hey, um, I want to use this thing day in, day out. I'm a tow truck driver. Oh, I yeah. am whatever. No, go, go, go with the pulley block. But again, for overland travelers, you can't have everything. This is a good way to have something out of, you know, you can shove that in the back of a drawer system. And it's uh, a fraction of the weight. That's a huge advantage. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cause those fractions of weight do add up. People might do. say, Oh, well, it's only 30 pounds less. I'm like, well, and obviously, yeah, so this exactly. is the biggest one we build. And, and again, coming back to uh, loading, you know, yeah. I, uh, yeah. and, and bought, you know, what, if you buy a pulley block or you buy a, a recovery ring from, I think there's five manufacturers doing them now. I think there's 5 million. I, Cause what's Probably, happened yeah. is they've ended up on Alibaba. So like oh, there's, yeah. there's like the, the, the Alibaba Overland companies, mm-hmm. like uh, all of them. Like all of them, like there's one that's like Overland vehicle, something they have one Overland vehicle systems. It's like $20 and it's like that big. Yeah. I would love to do some destructive testing on it. Right. Like, well, there's a lot of heat that generates in that very small diameter. Um, Yeah. So in, from my perspective, they do have their use. They need to be used um, with some additional training. Uh, They also, cause they are more complex than a typical pulley block. Uh, the rope can fall off of the ring and come in contact with the soft shackle, um, which can lead to almost immediate failure. Um, so the advantage of a traditional pulley block is they have uh, these wings that open and you put the line in there and then the wings close and then you, closed system. It's a closed system. So it, it, it does much better in dynamic uh, recovers between driving and winching. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use a ring for driving and winching, but it requires that marshal to be very mindful of the recovery ring. So again, for those that are listening, that can be an advantage. I do bring one along, but I bring it on along as my second pulley block. Um, and that's the reason why I bring it. Cause I want the second one to be lighter. Um, yeah take up less space. You, you lose, use that one less often. Correct. That becomes a much more complex system. Yeah. The biggie here is, and, and regardless is I, I have a pulley block at home and I, I don't use it, but it's specific. It looks like uh, an ARB pulley block. It looks yeah. exactly like it. And it says 9,000 on it. It doesn't say 9,000, anything. It just says 9,000. So again, back to that, make sure your equipment is good quality equipment. Sure. Like I said, the, the Alibaba stuff, um, yeah. make sure it's rated appropriately for your vehicle, you know, yeah. and the ratings should, like I say, they should there be is, on there. And, and, and I'll get on my high horse on quality recovery equipment here. Um, you know, when I ran on sealed four by four as the editor of that magazine in Australia, um, we did a huge comparison test where we went to the store and we bought three of every major snatch, snatch straps sold in the market. Um, as quite predictably, the cheaper brands, I mean, they were, you know, like right. three out of three, or I, I want to say we bought three, we did a wet test and then we did two dry tests at a certified rigging facility. You know, there was, it was a night and day between the quality stuff and, and, and the cheap stuff. I mean, ARB was the most consistent, which I think consistency, we awarded them the best because because it was the most consistent. You want things to be consistent. You don't predictable. Actually, yeah, you <laughs> yeah. don't. You don't want to buy a nine thousand, you know, pound uh, rated item and it breaks at eighteen, right? Or you know, breaking strength. There's <laughs> recovery stuff can be very uh, tedious <laughs> with its terminology. Yes. So I caught myself there. But yeah. you don't want something that is advertising one being actually a two. That's all I'm really trying to Absolutely. say there. Um, you know, so, so if, if there's any place that you're going to spend money again, I know I have bias with the whole max tracks and all that kind of stuff, but if there it's, it's even more appropriate, I think with anything involving a winch or, you know, kind of vehicle recovery by the best that you can afford. I, I think Cause that these are, these are safety devices. We have to understand there's safety devices that can turn into the opposite yeah, very, right. very, yes. very yeah, quickly. Right. Yeah, that's right. You know, those, those cheap, I was going to say, uh, name that ended in built, but I stopped myself. But those, <laughs> those, those, those Chinese pot metal shackles, right. Um, like boy, yeah, they can be really dangerous. They, they have, can have inclusions. They can have right. a lot of stuff. High inclusion yeah. rate. Exactly. Yeah. So, all right, well, let's talk. A, we've talked about pulley blocks. Let's talk about some other consideration. We'll just kind of run through this. Um, there's a tool called a transit cluster. They're used 
uh, typically by towing companies. Um, you can go on to Expedition Exchange that you know, John Lee there sells them all day long. Uh, but it allows you if you got to pull a Subaru off the trail or or it's a vehicle that doesn't have a recovery point, it allows you to key into those various holes on the frame. Um, again, these aren't rated recoveries. This is if everything has gone bad. Yeah, this or, is something a tow truck driver right. would carry them to get the Toyota Corolla out of there. Yeah, back. so you may want to consider a transit cluster. Um, we'll include that in the show notes. A winch line extension is a good idea, mm, particularly if you're traveling in areas without where that is not heavily forested. Um, if you're traveling in heavily forested areas, then then they're they're less important. Yeah, because there's you've got there's a, always there there may be a point that you can recover from, but there also may be a safer point just a little bit further. I always, always, always carry a winch line extension because I've been in so many scenarios where I have to use a winch. Five feet short. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you, and you get more winch line power, the more wraps you have around that drum too. So yeah, the fewer, the fewer, the fewer. Yeah. 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 So technical stuff. Um, additional things to consider, um, is having rated recovery points. ARB is one of the few that sells rated recovery points, but know what the gross vehicle weight rating is of your vehicle and know if your recovery points on your vehicle is rated for that gross vehicle weight. If not, consider having that upgraded, uh, make, make sure that you do that. Um, we also want to look at um, the idea of bringing along ground anchors like a pole pal, um, improvised solutions for that, which we could go into great lengths about. Yeah, like uh, but- there's that new dead man thing. And I think that, you know, there's almost a, a, a similarity between the discussion of the, um, you know, the recovery ring and a, and a more formal uh, pulley block. Um, you know, I think that the, you know, the, the dead man, they work really well. They're, you know, they're, they're very functional, but um maybe more of an emergency tool than let's say a pull pal where one's going to yeah. set itself. Right. One's going to have to, you know, require you to dig a hole, but a lot of, both lot of are better than not having it. Yeah. yeah. They can be very labor intensive for sure. I like to use the pull pal uh, on expedition seven because we were so remote so much of the time uh, we had a pull pal along in one of the vehicles and we used it a lot more often than I expected that we would. Um, but yeah, there's always the option of burying tires and all kinds of yeah. other ideas, um, that work. Um, but again, I found that pairing max tracks with a winch or, or vehicle to vehicle recovery tends to solve most of those problems. But when you need a pole pal, you really need it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's one yeah, of the yeah. few things that actually solves yeah, they're the problem. Great. They're great. Yeah. All right. And then the last thing around advanced considerations is a rear mounted winch, um, in most cases, winches are used for recreational purposes, which is why they're on the front. Um, if you are, let's say you're driving a very large vehicle like an earth roamer or you're driving a man vehicle and you can only put it one side or the other, you may actually be better off putting it at the rear of the vehicle, um, having a front and a rear winch if the gross vehicle weight allows for it. That can be another tool in the toolbox. Um, but I think that if you're doing vehicle recreation, you almost always want to have the winch on the front of the vehicle. What are your thoughts on that, Jim? Yeah, I mean, uh, Land Rover came out with the the SVX Discovery years ago, and it ended up just just being a uh, more of a show car. And it, it, because of all the front impact stuff, which is the problem with with modern cars and and aftermarket winches, um, they mounted one on the rear. Interesting. And we kind of looked at it and, and played with it a bit, and it. If you're, I grew up in a front winch world. Um, and so to have it in the back, you, you have to completely rethink your thought process. Yeah. It absolutely works. I mean, if you, if, if you're going in, it's, it's basically a, it's a defeatist winch. Sure. Um, cause yeah. you're going to go in and I'm not going to keep going forward. I've got to go back. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I know there's, there's all manner of, of receiver hitch, uh, portable winches, portable sure. winch trays, um, again, pluses and minuses. They give you versatility, which is nice, but, uh, side poles, incredible amount of leverage. They yeah. don't like side poles at all. It, yeah. it just bends them up like a cheap lawn chair. It does. Um, exactly. So, uh, exactly. yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, it, it, again, it just kind of keeps coming back to is what works for you. Yeah, um, whatever you simple. have, learn how simple. to use it. They did a, a expo years ago at Mormon Lake still. Um, a Volkswagen Jetta got stuck. It was the mud fest. And uh, a couple of us walked over. It's like, 
Let me get this thing. I, you know, it was push her to, and they already had the trunk lit up and the loop for the trunk they had hooked. Oh. And I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> no, I'm going to watch this from far because, and, and they, but again, you know, stepping outside the bounds, it worked. Yeah. They, the guy was super gentle. It was barely stuck and they just pulled him back onto yeah. the road. And it's uh, like, uh, I don't think I'd have done that. Sometimes but, you got to improvise, right? So, yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, it worked. So we, we touched on that idea, rated recovery points. Um, the thing that I'm super passionate about, so I've, I, like I've had to write these stories when people die. Um, oh, yeah. Do not use a tow ball as a recovery point because you're basically putting oh, thousands yeah. of pounds of energy with a, a with a kinetic strap behind a cannonball. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it will go through people. Right. And do not do it. And everything else. Yeah. Like if there's anything you take from this and you see somebody doing that, I mean, make sure you're not within cannonball range leave. and then <laughs> just leave honk or whatever you can do. But um, I've yeah. got a great picture of a CJ. And I, and, and it was cool cause I got the story behind it. So they're doing a, um, kinetic recovery, two straps, D shackle in the middle, Ooh. hooking the T straps together. And, uh, so CJ five is launching to pull this guy up. And so it doesn't work. doesn't work. So he keeps backing up, keeps giving it a whole bunch more welly. And, uh, so the last time, and the best part is when he's driving, he's doing this. So the D shackle or, or the, one of the straps, it would be the, the stuck vehicle strap breaks right there. That loop snaps and it launches the D shackle through right through the middle of the tire. So that steel that is mounted on the back of the Jeep through the back tailgate, through the headrest of the seat, through the windshield. And, and, it's, and so it basically with, with that recovery strap, it threaded the Jeep like a needle. And if he'd have been sitting like this driving, it'd have come gone right, right through, through his him. head. Yeah, it's just it's yeah. the force is amazing. Yeah, people people underestimate that that energy. They really do. And those and those straps are capturing energy. They're stretching oh. and they're absorbing and they're ready to catapult energy yeah. for sure. I'm going to release it somehow. Yeah, hopefully yeah. it's the car getting out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, I, I guess that kind of brings us into, in, into our next step, which is admitting defeat. Yeah. So I think that one of the keys around recovery is saying that it's not going to work. I'm going to admit defeat early. I'm not going to keep digging and spinning. Once you feel like you're not making progress, back off the throttle. Yeah, because you can make it, things worse in oh, yeah. multiple ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can make it so much more difficult. So, yeah. So, admit defeat early. Um, use recovery gear proactively. Put down max tracks ahead of the time. Um, get uh, your equipment ready. Um, unspool the winch and, uh, you know, battle wrap it around the bumper. All of those things uh, that can get you uh, prepared in advance if you really think that you're going to st- get stuck. Now, of course, the counterpoint to that is you could just send it, right? So, and a lot of people, I've been amazed at what some people can get through by just using a whole lot of momentum, but the risk goes up significantly with that. Uh, You've introduced all of this speed and you end up with a lot of vehicle damage in those kinds of scenarios. But I've also seen some incredible feats of driving skill and vehicle durability, usually Land Cruisers, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, getting through something um, by, you know, just sending it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. When it works, it's beautiful. And when it goes wrong, it's as great As slow video. as possible, as fast, fast as, as necessary. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Sometimes for people, Sometimes fast it's as very necessary, necessary means really yeah, fast. Yeah, they go right to the, to the second half yeah, of that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Now, since we've gotten stuck now, we're going to, we're going to, to, to your point earlier, Jim, was that let's make a cup of tea. Let's assess the situation. Let's formulate a plan. Um, I've heard it called a stuck assessment. Um, you know, essentially, just make a plan. Take some time. When you first get stuck, people, the adrenaline's high. People are amped up. People may be, they may feel embarrassed. Um, give it some time. Uh, relax. Uh go have a drink of water, go take a little short walk, and then come back with a fresh mind. And that's the point in time that you want to have that conversation with a group because people may have ideas, ask others how they would get it undone. Once you've decided on a plan, then we want to keep the uh, peanut gallery to a minimum. We don't want people uh, yelling while the stuck recovery is is uh, is happening. So yeah, we, like- want to, we want to make make a cup of tea, chill out. Yeah. I, and I am not ashamed of telling people to shut up. 
Yeah. You yeah. Know, yeah. Like if, if somebody, if, if, if that person is annoying you from the yeah. peanut gallery, tell them to stop, right? It's your vehicle or, or, you know, whomever is, is, is in charge of that recovery. You know, th- I, I don't think it's, it's unfair to, to, to ask people to just remove themselves. The one, the only exception to that rule that, that we teach, uh, and we always say, you know what, specifically, so if you're doing a winch operation and you have your, your, your person out marshalling that winch, it's, we're the only two people that exist with one exception. If anybody anywhere yells, stop. Yeah. Safety. That's the only thing is to stop. And they might be completely full of it. They might've seen something, you know, they might be talking to their dog who's running away. Um, but just that's fine. Stop and reassess. Everybody agrees that stop means stop no matter from, what. Yeah. No matter where yeah, it comes you're from. already stuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you are Pretty already much. in the situation, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's good advice. Yeah. Jim. And that's important for people to remember that they can be empowered to say stop, but pretty much nothing else because, right. um, it really can be disruptive, um, and unsafe for the people that are trying to get unstuck, uh, to get a whole bunch of chatter from the peanut gallery. Mm. All right. So now we're going to move on to some of the fundamentals of recovery techniques. Now we can't really do a lot around this in a podcast, but we're going to talk about it in the types of recovery techniques. Uh, So there's self-recovery, which can start by airing down more, even going to very low pressures in the sand um, to get you unstuck and then air up again to an operating pressure. Um, Of course, using a shovel um, and again, using recovery boards using sand ladders. There's a difference between a board and a ladder. Um, A ladder can also be used for bridging as well uh, for certain scenarios. Um, There's improvised solutions like even using your floor mat or like I tried to use with a, um, with the blunt, with the drapes and blunt. Um, You can have a bunch of people helping to push, Um, you know, sometimes just that little bit of human Effort and ingenuity can get you out of a stuck scenario. Yeah, in some parts of the world, like asking oh. for help might be your best scenario. Like if you're in Southeast Asia, yeah, just eight thousand people will show hey, up. Hey, can can you come push? Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how many times have we seen somebody getting pulled out with a a line of oxen or whatever? And yeah, I mean, how cool is that? That Ray adds- Highland has some just amazing <laughs> yeah. stories yeah. of you know being in Indonesia somewhere, Malaysia somewhere in the rainforest and. Oh, well, we're stuck. Okay, well, wait five minutes and there's going to be they some just people show that come up. by. Yeah, yeah. yeah. people show up out of, out of everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so those are self-recovery solutions. Um, then we're, we've got vehicle-mounted electric winches. We can also use what's called a tier for style winch, um, which basically is a hand-over-hand um, passing, essentially. It's a me- mechanism inside the tier for winch that, that pulls the, the winch line, captures it, relocates the pulling component and then pulls it again. Um, and they're very slow. They do work they They tend to be very lightly rated. Um, if they're rated for real work, then they are massive and they kind of yeah. defeats the purpose. Um, if you're doing a lot of crazy driving and really muddy situations, or I use it in the snow for side slopes and stuff like that, because then you can connect it to the rear of the vehicle to create a pendulum effect um, and take up slack and keep the rear of the vehicle from sliding. Works great for that. High lift does the same thing. These are improvised tools. They aren't ideal for most scenarios. Anything else that you've used like that, Jim? Um, I've, I've used everything (laughs) mainly because again, you know, went so many years without a winch. And again, you find there's a great YouTube where the guy uses the two logs and creates a winch. I saw that. And, and, and I had never thought Fascinating. of that. Fascinating. It's just like, that will work. So um, I like to always tell people, it's it's basically limited to the equipment you have, what's around you, and your imagination. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look around, I mean, as simple as a, a straight a straight line, like uh, you using a, a um, winch extension, and that ridge line, the force in the middle is four to seven times each side. So sometimes just having that rigid line and a vehicle stuck, you can, you can get a couple of people to push that's right. pull and it gets enough. I mean, just that that's much. a lot of so, leverage. Exactly. So yeah, that's fascinating. It's good stuff. Um, again, people, uh, we, we, we did a, we did a Jeep job in Turkey years ago and the same, th- we were creating a, a really difficult route and people kept showing up and fixing a road. You know, I mean, quite literally they were making a freeway for us and, but people show up and, and people, that that's got it's it's got to be a worldwide thing. Most of the time, they they want to help. 
Yeah. If, if you sure. say, Hey, could you help out? I've never had somebody go, no. Yeah. I mean, they just all want to help. So yeah, just using what's around you. Yeah. The locals can really add a lot. They can add a lot of drama and, <laughs> yes. and yeah. problems as well yeah. uh, because usually they're excited, you know, they, yeah. and they, but they may not have the same training you do. So make sure that you are be specific, uh, c- kind. <laughs> you, you always want to be kind in your communications. You always want to be specific in your communications, but also don't be afraid to be assertive because at the end of the day, it's your, your vehicle and your safety. Um, so on the vehicle mounted winches, um, the winch rating. So again, we want to be looking at that about 1.5 times gross vehicle weight. Um, if you get the winch closer and closer to the gross vehicle weight of the vehicle, like let's say it's a 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight, you have a 6,000 pound winch, um, then you're going to be taxing that winch and you're going to have to be very specific about the number of wraps that you're using to get that maximum pull. Um, You're also going to need to introduce pulley blocks. So you typically want to have a winch that's rated about 1.5 times to two times gross vehicle weight. Um, Has that been your experience as well, Jim? Yeah. And and, and just a couple of things here, and you kind of touched on it, is winches are rated with an empty spool. And so basically that first wrap on that spool is where you get the 9,000. If it's each wrap after that, you lose about 15%. Sure. So by the time you get the most, most, if you have a normal amount of rope, you have about five wraps. So you've really lost that um, pulley block. You pull off twice as much. That helps that because you get down sure. to those lower wraps. Um, and people underestimate, again, so my car is a pretty heavy car. It weighs 5,000. We'll have a 9,000 pound winch. I should be, I can lift it vertically, but people underestimate, you know, if there's a little slope, if it's buried to the frame rails, how much actual force it takes to move that vehicle. That's where the one and a half times comes in. Yeah, absolutely. And we, if we don't want to go with too much winch either, because we've added unnecessary expense, we've added unnecessary weight, we've reduced the line speed as well, which is slow, winch is not necessarily a bad thing, but um, there are consequences also with going with too heavy of a winch. Sure. Um, you know, yeah, you don't, don't want to put a 16, five <laughs> worn on a samurai. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> you want to pull the frame apart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want to use the appropriate tools for the job. Right. Um, so that's around vehicle um, mounted winches. We also want to make sure that we have uh, a way to connect up the line. We want to have connection points. We want to have tree straps. Uh, we want to have appropriate anchors, as well, um, which means that it could be on another vehicle if we're winching to another vehicle or if we're coming back to our own vehicle, uh, that any of those connection points need to be rated for the load that we're asking of the system uh, for sure. Now, we talked a little bit about synthetic versus steel cable. Um, There is no hard and fast rule on it. Uh, The Dyneema will always be safer. Um, The cable will oftentimes be more durable, and that's the reason why people Oftentimes, I, I, I think cable. the the main benefit these days of synthetic lines are the fact that the cargo capacity of vehicles, I don't want to say is dwindling, but the vehicles are getting heavier and they can't, you know, carry as much. Um, you know, you can lose a lot of weight very sure. quickly by going to synthetic. So yeah. that also plays a factor, you know, in, in, in my opinion, not having to have an extra 50, 60, 70 pounds, you know, at the furthest most point of your vehicle from that axle that there is a benefit there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And um, the counterpoint to the winch is obviously winches are expensive. And to your what you talked about earlier, Jim, is you've got all these other components that you need to buy and and even upgrading batteries and everything else. You can you can pay for a whole trip yeah. with just the cost of a winch. So sure. if if you travel mostly in the desert southwest or you don't really travel in muddy conditions or you've got um, yeah, that good. Choya cactus isn't going to pull you. <laughs> yeah. be a good, yeah. suitable recovery. So, yeah. yeah, so there are times where you don't want to have a winch, or you want to make sure that, or you might say that it's less of a priority. Um, so, and also vehicles can really pack up against their gross vehicle weight rating. So, and a winch is a heavy item. So we need to be mindful of how much weight a winch adds as well. All right, so now we're getting to the last little component of our discussion, which is vehicle to vehicle recovery. Um, what are some things, Jim, that you've seen around uh, vehicle to vehicle recovery? What are some good basic techniques or things to be mindful around vehicle to vehicle recovery? So I guess, I mean, two things again, are you using the second vehicle as a, just an anchor? And then it becomes basically your standard winch. Yeah. You know, you're using a winch line versus kinetic. Um, and kinetic is probably the fastest way people 
people, especially people when they have a brand new winch, they always want to pull out the winch rope. Um, but it, again, slow, methodical, it takes time versus it's like, you know, you can put a, a kinetic rope or a strap on there and we're down the road in two minutes. Yeah. Um, where people get into trouble. And so my, my rule, rule of thumb uh, is for just doing a, a kinetic recovery is I'll hook the vehicles together and I'll back up. So basically the, the line is on the ground and that's it. And that gives me about a car length before. And so, and the whole thought process is, is I want the front car to have momentum. The rope stretches, it transfers all that momentum and energy back to the back car, hopefully popping them out. Um, I've seen people for their first pull, I mean, back up almost bumper to bumper. Sure. And again, it's like the winch where you're creating a massive amount of energy, depending on how much sure. you're getting out. And you will discover the weak link. Yeah. Hopefully it's the, the vehicle stuck moving. But um, it, again, you, with that kinetic energy, it's going to transfer somewhere. So I start very conservative, you know, do that little boom and, and see what happens. Did the car move a little bit? Cool. A little bit more. We're down the road. It didn't move at all. Um, when I find myself backing up to where the rope's about halfway under my car, I'll give that a shot and I'm giving it a bit more welly each time. Um, but I'm easing into that increasing of energy. Um, if I get to that point and nothing's moved, I'm probably going to get out. We're going to have a conversation and, and yeah. come up with a plan B. Yeah. Sure. Maybe, maybe the vehicle's, you know, high centered, maybe there's a rock in a front of the digging. differential yeah, something, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What is the minimum effective dose, right? So if, yeah. if we can, sometimes it doesn't require backing up at all. Sometimes just, um, getting it under tension, it starts to build up some energy in the rope itself. Um, and it easily extracts the vehicle, particularly if the recovering vehicle um, is highly capable. Um, sure. You know, you take a Jeep Rubicon on 40s and it's going to pull a lot of things out without even having to back up or, or any welly at all. Yeah. Um, put it into low gear and and just and slowly pull it out. So you really want to do that minimum effective dose because we don't want to introduce a lot of energy into the system that we don't need to. Now, there are certainly times that you have to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. So. Um, the other thing that's key around that is communications. That's where it's good to have radios. So that way you can communicate like I'm going, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to go, which the vehicle that's being recovered can see that. But the person that's doing the recovery may not know that you're unstuck or they may not know that you've hung up on something or something has failed. So having a way to communicate is really important. And um, if you don't and have radios find a simple system of communication exactly. that, that can like be like a horn, yeah. a horn, yeah. <laughs> like most, most cars have them, yep. Yep. you know, yeah. one horn, it means go. Um, yeah. Two yes. horns means stop. Yeah. yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. We did a, we did a recovery, um, back again, back at the, the, the one Mormon Lake mud fest. And I, I remember as a German couple who were overlanding around the world, and they had this giant man truck. Sure. And, uh, they, they augured in and I mean, it went down and, uh, he kept saying, oh, yeah, I'm just going to air down. It's like, <laughs> well, bud, you know, uh -huh. I, I, pass that one, bud. You, you can't beat physics. Um, yeah. So quite literally, they said, hey, Jim, go get your car, which, which is my discovery, and uh, hooked up a strap to it. And uh, one of my uh, fellow instructors, uh, Lee McGee, I trust him implicitly, um, he was that link of communication. And so I know how what's in my mind. He knew what was in his mind. And we got out of jive. Um, so he said, back up, back up, back up. Cool. You're good. And I, I leaned out and said, so I got just the ropes on the ground. Right. And he said, yep. Which meant something different apparently to both of us. So I took off, uh, knowing that I'm going to have about a car length. Mm -hmm. And so I, I gave it quite a bit knowing that the man truck was massively heavy compared to my car. I'm not creating much energy. And you have that point where I should have hit the end of the rope by now. Yeah. And I hadn't. And it's like, and I was literally, I went another full car length and the car, my car is accelerating. Well, diesel. So as, as fast as this, as fast your car's as, up to three miles. An hour. Yeah, it was, it was, it was massive acceleration. <laughs> oh, um, 95 horsepower. Yes. It's 111. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I was trying to be insulting and that was actually even worse. It is, it's sad on so many levels. Um, but you reach that point where you think something should happen and it hasn't. Sure. And I was literally about ready to come out of the throttle when I hit the end of it and a, a big transfer of energy and it yanked the truck right out. Yeah, I bet. And, and it was this whole David and Goliath thing. Cause you see this little bitty discovery in this giant man truck, but 
it worked well, but yeah. we were not in sync where we should have been. We sh- uh, and again, that conversation, you have to be on the same page because if things go wrong, they can go horribly wrong. Yeah. And slowing down, making sure you're on the same page. And I guess to, to summarize some of the most important things is to really focus on safety, focus on communication, focus on training before you make any significant purchases around recovery. Okay. So then we've also got Overland Experts as a great resource. Yeah, 7P International, obviously fantastic. And then anybody Overland in, in Overland in BC, that's Chris Walker. He's yep. up in- um, Up outside of Vancouver. Outside of Vancouver. Yep. Great dude. Super experienced. Works Absolutely. with all Land Rover guys. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, you, there's this thing, Google, you know, just <laughs> yeah, maybe check ask it around, yeah. you know, yeah. check it out and get, get recommendations. Um, and- Jim, where can people find out more about you? What, what's your, you have a social media oh, Lord. channel that you, that you maintain on Instagram or. I do. Um, it'd be great if I knew that, wouldn't it? Um, MyQuestAdventures.com is probably the best way that has all okay. the links to every place. That's basically my own company. So the stuff that, that happens in the Phoenix Valley, that's what I run through. Awesome. Uh, I'm a yeah. part owner with 7P. So we do that with 7p.io is the website there. Um, again, on Facebook and all the, all the social medias um, for pretty much any kind of training pretty much around the world. So Yeah, I, I can't recommend uh, 7p enough. Each one of those individuals have impressed me in some way significantly in my time working with them. So a great organization. Uh, Matt, what is your, uh, what's your current social thing on Instagram. I hate social media. <laughs> I, so I, I guess hates, as of Matt hates social media, I guess as of today, I'm back on Instagram, which is Matt explore. I occasionally go on it. That and is all. So make sure you troll Matt explore. There you go. Please. And I am Scott.a.brady on Instagram. And we appreciate all of you for listening. Uh, please reach out uh, via those social channels to Matt or I, if you have any additional questions or comments or concerns around the podcast that we can address for you. And we thank you all for listening and we will talk to you next time.